So I'm going to talk about grid management and demand flexibility. And since it's the end of the day, I'll try to make this as conversational as possible. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, Rich's uh, talk that he just gave was a good introduction into the kinds of things. I'm going to be talking a little about uh, what's going on in California, but around the country, um, and how the grid is changing, um, grid services from buildings, technologies, and then residential interoperability. Because we just heard uh, over the last few months that uh, Google Home and Alexa and a whole bunch of them are starting to, I think they're working with the Zigbee Alliance. Is that right, Rich? Yeah. So, so um, there's Zigbee radios in our meters in California, supporting something called Smart Energy Profile Version 1, which um, meter as a gateway did not work. You were supposed to be able to go to Home Depot and buy a thermostat with that would talk to that radio. Um, and now everything's over Wi-Fi. So, so, but there's other things too, and I'll talk a little about some of that. So, so that's something that we can all relate to because some people have these things in their homes. Um, I just ask it to play the radio or play music. You know, uh, my husband turns it off, and he unplugs it because he doesn't like when Alexa asks random things. <laughs> so, you've all, many of you who have one of these things have probably heard Alexa say strange things in your home. Yeah. I should, I should, in, that's a web portal? No, it's, a, it's part of the website. You can go in and you know, put your smart device and there's a checkbox to turn on that. How do you, what are you turning off? Turning off that nuisance, asking more questions. Oh, say, okay. Yeah, talking back. That is very rude, these rude devices. So, so, um, so the grid's changing and, you know, that's a good thing because uh, so I, as this morning we talked about, there's three sectors that use energy, transportation, industry, and homes, or buildings, building, uh, and the, the electric supply is changing. So we want to better link uh, supply and demand. And uh, over the last um, hundred years, as we built out the electric system, when we need more power, we just build more power plants. Uh, but we have this challenge that uh, this is an intermittent variable resource. So this concept of storage is a growing issue. And if it's cloudy for three days in California in the winter, we got a problem. So long duration storage, which um, Rich was just talking about hydrogen. We had a, a two or three day power outage here with a shutoff, as Chris mentioned. And there's been all kinds of thinking about how many megawatts of storage do we need here to keep up the supercomputers and the advanced light source? And uh, it's, a big, it's a big challenge to think about uh, islanding the national. We will not keep every building up, but we may try to keep up the critical, the, uh, something called the, uh, uh, the electron microscopes and, and the molecular foundry and, and some of the critical facilities. So um, these meters, so these meters are not throughout the United States, but California has them on every home. And uh, Janie's actually an expert in the emissions from these. If you have questions after the break, you can ask her. She's done a lot of research on people's concerns about the emissions from smart meters. Uh, but but uh, they have these Zigbee radios that you heard about uh, that we're not using. They're, you can actually get um, four second data, four second power data off of them. So, so And sometimes we're actually getting real time KW off these uh, it's not always reliable. Uh, the radio has, um, it, if you have, uh, you know, chicken wire in your in your in your plaster in older homes, that's a Faraday cage, and it can't even transport through the house very well. So there's all kinds of reasons these Zigbee radios had some trouble. But these these are these are um, part of the future is having 10 second data, five minute data, 15 minute data, at least hourly. Um, and, and what do we do with that data? Why do we want it? Well, California wanted it because we want a demand response, and I'll talk about the different kinds of demand response. So this is one of the curves that I mentioned this morning. This is called, we call this the Rosenfeld curve. The red line is the United States, and the blue line is California. And um, the kilowatt hours per person for the last 30, 40 years in California has been flat. That's energy per person. Energy per person has not gone, number of people has gone up. But the electricity use per person has not gone up, okay? It's been flat. And that's because of our, you know, we have more and more devices, but we have a lot of efficiency investment. We have very aggressive building codes. Um, we have uh, uh, very efficient lighting, as you, and that is 
throughout the United States. But we've had, we were very early to require LED lighting. Um, but this is going to go up. This is not going to stay flat. This is not going to stay flat. This blue line is going to go up. Why is the electricity per person going to go up in California? Electric cars, EVs, EVs. That's one of the primary reasons. So, so our energy, our electricity per person is going to start to go up. And that's a good thing because this is not a carbon curve. If we showed carbon per person, um, it would look totally different. I don't even know what it looks like, um, and, but, I, but I should because that's the new thing that we're actually now spending a lot of our time around is carbon. But carbon is, you know, in California, our electricity is pretty clean. It's clean in Hawaii. Um, uh, it's clean in the Northwest. Why is it clean in the Northwest? Hydro. hydro. So they, they've been all electric for a while. Um, and hydro is a form of storage. So they don't have the same. Now, if they have a drought, um, they can have problems, and they may want demand response on those days. They have a lot of wind. And wind integration is actually challenging because they have contracts that are must run, and the, the wind gets used first. So, so around the around the United States, the uh, this clean resources, whether it's wind or solar or hydro or geothermal, we in California have a lot of geothermal. Uh, so the sources of energy are changing, but but this is an important curve. And then the other curve is this duck curve, um, which which uh, Rich showed you, and I'm going to show you a couple more details about the duck. So one of the things about the duck is um, we're, we actually have times when electricity prices are negative. Um, because we generate so much Speaking of managing the electrical grid, you just ran out of battery. Okay. This one's lighter, it's better from my hand. Uh, okay, so Memorial Day of uh, 2019. This orange here, check this out. So 20 gigawatts, 20 gigawatts, which is uh, 20,000 megawatts. Uh, 20 gigawatts on, on Memorial Day, May 27th, this much electricity we couldn't use. It was the most, 16% of the renewable energy use that was generated was spilled. 39 gigawatt hours that day uh, was curtailed. We couldn't, we generated more energy than we could use. Now, if we had storage, we would soak it up. Um, and if we had seasonal storage, we would soak it up and use it on a hot day in the summer or in the winter. Um, but, but we have this problem. And, and here you can see the different um, colors the baseline nuclear, the uh, large hydro, the thermal, the imports. So we import electricity from other states, uh, the curtailment, the renewables, and the exports. So we don't have a very flexible grid. And one of the things that Rich and I are studying is can building loads, can building loads um, soak some of that up? If you had, oh, or EVs, charge all the EVs then, you know, when that price is really low. So the basic idea is, can you match supply and demand and minimize that curtailment and minimize the ramp? So here, I'm going to show you the ducks. So this is 2014. And here in spring, here in March, April, you, the, so this is, the, this is the, uh, the total state net load for California by January, February, March, April all the way through to December. So this is what the net load looks like. And remember, the net load is the total load minus the renewables. And these black dots are the top 250 hours. So here in August and in September, when it's hot, you'll see we're, we're in the high 30s. And then in winter, you know, we're, not, we're in the 20s. But in the summer, it still looks like you think the grid should look like. Um, it's peaking in the afternoon. Here it's peaking you know, at, uh, at, at 3 in the afternoon or something like that, which is traditionally, demand response traditionally has been hot summer days. Um, capacity problem. 
not an energy problem, a capacity problem. And so uh, we had to build power plants for those top hot days, those 250 days, 250 hours where the system is peaking and understand, um, did we have enough supply for those top hours? So here's 2020 uh, and then here's 2025. So what we see in 2025 is what look like ducks every month. So it's not a spring problem anymore. So we see this duck shape. So even in summer, you know, this belly exists sometimes. So, so again, looking at 2014, where there's no duck belly, but you see ducks kind of in December. Some people call these alligators. That's Vermont, they, they're alligators in Vermont. And um, we have different animals we talk about. Some people say turning it into a halibut or teaching the duck to fly, you know, all kinds of <laughs> animals that people see. Uh, but, but, we see, but we see this shape, it's quite dramatic, um, the, the, the spring duck uh, we see in November. So the shape is what we care about. And, and all of this excess solar uh, in uh, the middle of the day. So we have these four words, shape, shift, shed, and shimmy. I spoke about this a couple of years ago. Anybody remember shape, shift, shed, and shimmy? Okay, so these are the four grid services that we make it easy to remember. Um, and shape is, shape, I'll go through each of them, but shape is the idea that you can respond to a tariff and you can shape your load because you're doing price response, you're doing tariff response. Shift is what we need because of the duck. So we wanna shift loads from one time of the day to another. Shed is our traditional demand response. Um, and we've been modeling how much California has and needs of these different things. And shimmy, we call this fast acting demand response, which acts on, on, on minutes. And, or seconds, and um, for some grid services, the wholesale market operators want four second telemetry. And so we actually have fast acting loads. A VFD can actually do some of these things. So we've, we've been doing um, some work in FlexLab where a variable frequency drive may be uh, supplying f uh, air to a zone, but also moving around and following a grid signal. So we actually followed a PJM a grid signal, a, a regulation, reg up, reg down, on a, on a VFD that was providing energy to, providing ventilation to the zone as well as grid services. So building loads that are following signals have different time scales of the way they wanna interact with the grid. And this shimmy um, service is, it's more expensive. It has a lot of controls involved. Um, but when we want this late afternoon ramping, Sometimes we can get um, megawatts per minute from building loads that are moving around. A VFD is a good example. Uh, a, maybe a pool pump. You know, a pool pump is an example of a technology where it can run any hours over 24. And, and it's all, it, it may be that you can turn it on and off. You, you, yeah, you, you, I mean, a, a VFD is good because you can set it at one point and it, it can actually go up and down. Maybe even a, a, a electronic ballast. We've been looking at LEDs and things like that and grid services from different uh, technologies. So we've been looking at, uh, batteries can do these things too. But the problem with batteries is they, you, if, you, if your battery is doing grid services, it may not be available to do daily time of use optimization. Or, or, so batteries are often doing one thing, but they may be able to do multiple grid services to help manage the grid. So these shed, sh shift, shed, shift, shape, and shimmy, this is shed. Shed is a hot summer day response. The most traditional thing is air conditioner cycling. How many of you have AC cycling in your areas? And how many of you, your home is on AC cycling? And how many of you hate it, but you're willing to do it? How many of you are doing it with a smart thermostat? Sometimes, like Nest has what's called rush hour rewards programs. So around dinner time or DR times, the, they will, if you have a Nest thermostat, you can, you can do some of this um, automatically and you get, get paid for that. So, so in, the, in, the, in the old days, the utilities had air conditioner cycling controls that they managed the infrastructure and they would cycle your air conditioner. Um, now with a smart thermostat, uh, they just send a signal to Nest and Nest is doing it, and it, they don't have to own the technology. They're working through a third party. 
So that's the future, is, is where the utility is partnering with bring your own thermostat, BYOT, or bring your own device, BYOD programs. So we're seeing more and more of those. Then shift is the idea of using more in the middle of the day and less at other times of the day. Um, super off-peak rates, this is one of my favorite things. SoCal Edison has a tariff where the lowest price is the middle of the day. When has the lowest price been over the last 30 years? At night, at night. So this is, this is really different. You know, um, they also have, they call this matinee pricing. You know, uh, there's all kinds of, again, things to try to help people remember. This doesn't, this isn't common practice yet, but this is where we're going. Um, and it may be that your price changes California, uh, we will have a time of use pricing next fall. And so we will have this high price from five to nine. When has the peak been historically, the high price time for tariffs? Two to six, two to six. Two to six. And, and, uh, and office buildings have peaked when the grid has peaked. Now homes are peaking when the grid is peaking. Because you get home and you turn on your air conditioner and that's when the grid's peaking. And, and that's, a, that's a big problem in California because um, people don't, people want to turn on their air conditioner and maybe their shower if they have a heat pump or their con convection oven, do their laundry, all their stuff. Uh, yeah, so Alexa might be able to say, Alexa, when should I wash the dishes? When should I turn on the dishwasher? And Alexa may say, turn it on at 10 o'clock. Or Alexa may turn it on at 10 o'clock. So you can imagine in the, hall, in the future, you actually have your devices listening and running your home on economy mode that is low price operation and your devices are listening to a signal like this and your dishwasher's running at noon instead of the middle of the night and, and you may save money doing that. So that's, that's the idea. And then this is the fast acting stuff. Some of this is energy neutral and loads can go up and down, but this is pretty sophisticated and it's more expensive infrastructure, but often building loads can do some of that sort of thing. So um, we've been modeling, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but we've been doing work on trying to look at all the t types of loads in California and what they can do. Um, we look at how fast they can respond, like a light, a light can fast respond very fast. A motor and an air conditioner are slower and that's purposeful. You don't want compressors banging on and off. So we look at how fast things respond. EVs can respond pretty quickly. Um, I'm not going to go through all the detail, but we have been modeling space heating and space. So there are things in red. California is looking at electrifying space heat and water heating. Um, so we've been looking at programmable thermostats, and, and there's a lot of interest in heat pump water heaters, grid interactive heat pump water heaters. Now, electric resistance water heaters, you get a lot. You get, how much are they? A kilowatt? Half a kilowatt? They're pretty big. Um, and heat pump is 20% of that. So, so, so the utilities like if you have an electric resistance heat pump and you're willing to be in their programs. They get a big chunk. You, you have one? Yeah. But from an energy efficiency perspective, the heat pump is better, but there's less grid services, less KW. So it's kind of an, inter in, we're at this time where the energy efficiency and the grid services are kind of interacting. In general, energy efficiency first. Um, we don't want to keep a load high just to transact it, um, but that's a big debate uh, because if it's a more flexible load, maybe we want it and maybe the value of those, that storage that it provides is, is something valuable. So we're doing a lot of work on you know, pool pumps, refrigerated warehouses, and onboard thermal storage um, like we were just, Rich was just talking about, and, and, and grow lights. Um, so actually, actually changing, changing the color, uh, that, so there's all kinds of technology. The, the ones in gray here, we have not modeled yet. So right now, there is one company I know of that will turn off your refrigerator. Um, and I used to think that was crazy. They will actually put a plug strip, a controller, and for their demand response events, Ohm Connect will turn off your refrigerator. And I thought, I do not want to turn off my refrigerator. But after going for two days with the power shut off, my refrigerator did okay. Because I had big things of, fro of frozen water bottles in there. I was ready for it. Yeah. Uh, it depends, yeah. If you if you if you bring in that warm beer and then turn it, then it's not going to work, you know. But if it's already got some mass in there and, and you don't open the freezer, 
anything in there. Right. That's what I tell my family is put stuff in there, put the you know, put extra drinks in there. Yeah. So uh, okay. So I this is just this is so we look at um, the cost per kilowatt hour per year. So this these are different kinds of things and. The ones to the left here are very um, cost effective. So um, pool pumps, we can get a lot of demand response for $50 a kilowatt hour per year. Um, and actually, water heating is pretty expensive for those heat pump water heaters. So we're doing a lot of work on which of these technologies can provide shift, and uh, where are they in California, and how big is the kilowatt hours available from them. Uh, this, this is an important curve I'm going to talk with you about. This is from a company called Watt Time. And on the, on the left axis here is marginal emissions. So tons of CO2 per megawatt hour. So the idea here, in the future, today we benchmark energy per square foot in our buildings. We know our EUI, uh, we, we collect EUIs and we compare buildings. And in, in cities, uh, the uh, disclosure laws, buildings have to disclose their energy per square foot. In the future, we might want the carbon per square foot. So now if you use natural gas, your carbon footprint is much higher than if you're all electric. And if you are a building that can use some of this clean energy in the middle of the day, you see this energy is clean. This is 0.2 uh, tons of CO2 per megawatt hour, and this one's 0.4. So this is twice as bad um, for the grid or for your carbon emissions. If you are a building and you just ran on, you know, what uh, this, is, this is spring, um, in the summer, it's not as clean because, because we have a lot of load. Uh, and then different times of the year is, is different. But in general, you can compare how clean is the midday versus the evening. Um, and we want to shift a lot of loads to the middle of the day, which, again, is a very new paradigm uh, for controlling buildings. And then this is statewide. We've been modeling. The, so on the, on the um, 2025 and 2030, we've been modeling electrifying space heat and electrifying water heating. And these are loads that weren't there before. They're not big yet because it's going to take a while for California to try to electrify. But there's a big push. Southern California Edison has a $50 million a year program to electrify space heat and water heat. And, you know, 30 years ago, that was sacrilege. Why would you use electricity to heat something because we burn things in power plants and then we sent it over to the building rather than burning something on site. But now because we're using different sources of electricity, uh, this, is, this is the kind of the future, the way we're seeing it. Peter, do you have a question? What is the assumption projection? That's a good question. We spent a lot of time on um, penetration rates. And uh, Rich, you don't remember, do you? The, that you, you probably you weren't even involved in that. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a whole report. It's it's public now. We're about to publish it. Um, but uh, they are turnover rates and and adoption rates. It, it's not. It's still you know gas is cheap. So this is actually very difficult. Um, I have a gas space heat and a gas water heater, and. Uh, you know, at some point I'll get a heat pump, but, you know, I don't know when they're going to offer the incentives. SMUD offers, so tr I have a place up in Truckee, and they, they will give you $3,000 if you switch from a gas heat pump to, I mean, a, a gas water heater to a heat pump water heater. Um, but we had to do a lot of electrical work to upgrade the system, and there's nobody up there who really knows how to do it. So it's a... In Southern California, in, in Sacramento, in Southern California, you're going to see it before you do in PG&E service territory because PG&E sells gas. So, so it's, a, it's coming, but uh, I can't tell you all the details about these. But these are, these are fairly aggressive scenarios, uh, and we're looking at um, California, if we electrify space heat and, and water heating, will likely become winter peaking where some are peaking. Also, when people put in these heat pumps uh, in their homes for space heat, they're getting air conditioning. So we might actually see more energy use in cooling than we have now. But that's OK because it's clean. So it's just a little bit strange, the, the, uh, the energy uh, logic here. Uh, and then commercial, we're also looking at um, these are the end uses. It's remarkable 
how big uh, lighting still is, the green there, um, but we're looking at the hourly loads and how they're changing over time. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little about residential, and I'll try to do this in five minutes because we're, I'm at the end of you know, what we've countered for the, this presentation. I, I try to do it quickly. So, uh, oh, I forgot my show and tell. I have a couple of things. So I have, um, I have, first I have a, a, a book, and this is related to Jessica's work. This is called Energy Information Handbook, Applications for Efficient Building Operations. And we may have showed this in the past. Yeah. It is, I'll pass it around. It's available on, on Amazon, I think. Um, so I'm, this is just something you can buy if you want to use in your classes. But more relevant to this discussion, um, this is a internet gateway with relays. And uh, these are for commercial, this is an echelon gateway. There's a lot of gateway boxes. And this is the communication stack that, that exists. When we think about communicating signals for demand response, we have what's called the physical layer, the domain layer, and the application layer. This device is all of these. If it's running an application layer protocol, you all know about BACnet. That's a within building protocol. And we use something called OpenADR, um, which is a protocol from the utility to the building. And it, you can install it in a control system using a device like this. So I'll, I'll talk a little about that. And then IEEE 2030.5 is the new SEP2, <coughs> the Smart Energy Profile version 2. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little about that. But we're basically using Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or cellular. Um, a lot of this is TCP IP now. And uh, these are application layer uh, for grid services that I, I can pass this around to. So this, this uh, is OpenADR. Uh, we started this in 2002. It, we, ver we published version one of OpenADR, OpenADR in 2006. In 2011, it became a NIST. It became a national standard. So it's basically a data model Something like a kilo, dollars per kilowatt hour, a price signal, gets put into an open ADR data model. We use the internet. Uh, it has servers and clients, or top nodes and end nodes. pg and &E, Edison, uh, and uh, the utilities in California have servers, and they send signals to the buildings. So we automate the demand response using boxes like this that we install on control systems. And the building is pre-programmed to reset the temperature in a zone or something like that for demand response. So these grid services, that something that uh, uh, Rich was telling you about, the Humboldt State, and the technology, these, these model predictive control systems in the future, imagine if you're getting price signals from the utility and you have a controller that's looking at the energy use. This building, when you guys were looking at how this zone performs, the electricity use of this zone was not even in the data stream. We do not, our control systems don't manage energy use. They manage HVAC. Uh, but in the future, the whole building KW might be part of the control system. And if you did that, you could have these grid services interacting with the grid. So we can, we can pre-program the building to do something with this kind of technology. It is here. So this is, the, so, so it's really, it's, so this is uh, the open ADR data model. It's really here. Uh, let me see if I have any other pictures. I, didn't, I did most of this on. So this is a residential example, but um, Target has 800 buildings around the United States that use open ADR in their automated logic control systems. Automated logic was the first control company that when you bought an ALC system, you could get open ADR already in there. So the idea was, if you get a Metasys or a JCI or a Siemens and you already have the software that interacts with uh, the grid signals, it's very easy to configure it. But today's buildings, most of them, you need a hardware gateway to get the signal from the internet and then a relay to the controls. So that's got relays, um, but, but there's a lot of different ways you can get open ADR signals to the building. So I talked about that in the past. I could, I could send you a link if you're interested in more. But, but for homes, 
so, so in this picture, the building receives a signal from the utility, um, mostly HVAC systems. Um, but open ADR is also used with EV charging and a lot of different systems. So this is encrypted and authentication. So there's a lot of secure interaction. PG&E has to say, this, it's going to this target over in Hayward. And that's done through a secure network, like a banking you know, encryption. But these systems, when, when we developed open ADR, um, we had these Zigbee radios on the, on the, on the meters, um, but those Zigbee radios didn't work. So right now, when Nest gets an open ADR signal, the, the utilities open ADR cloud is talking to the vendor's cloud. So it's all cloud to cloud, and then it's proprietary from the cloud to your Nest thermostat. So, so that's an issue is these different architectures of how these things work. So um, this is basically that picture. So the smart thermostat revolution, uh, we have uh, the ability to control loads as you have a smart devices in your home. How many of you have, you have smart lights? So, so smart lights, now your lights aren't usually on on a hot summer day, uh, but they may be on in a winter event. But you, I don't, you know, really the thermostat is the key load that the utilities want to interact with. But pool pumps is definitely one of the loads that we're seeing in California. And it, heat pump water heaters or other water heaters are other loads. Right now, there's not, there's not a hub that's talking to your dishwasher and your pool pump and your water heater. But Alexa and Google Home are trying to become that. EV charger. If, so if you have a BMW EV and a Tesla Powerwall and a Nest thermostat, they don't talk together. But they're, they're working on it. But they call, control them individually. They control them individually, not like your whole. So. So where do you live? Well, that's impressive. And what utility is it? Okay, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, so so that's more advanced. So so if you guys want to know what the future looks like in Delaware, they're doing it, but a lot of the country doesn't have it yet. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. These are um, some of the IoT platforms that now do you, does your stuff interact with some of the IoT? So, so you might say, At Alexa, when should I run my washing machine? And Alexa would say, the lowest price for the next 24 hours will be X. And it, we don't have that yet, but we want machine-readable or digital tariffs so these devices can get those signals. Uh, so this is smart speaker penetration. This is some data we've been putting together for the utilities. Um, so Amazon's the big one, but Google and there's, there's other ones. So a lot of smart speakers are coming. Uh, and then all these different platforms, uh, there's a lot of different, as you know, um, different kinds of communication technologies. And 5G uh, is another thing that people are excited about, getting 5G communication with water heaters. So again, is it going to be centralized or is it going to be each device individually? That's one of the big questions. Uh, so uh, EPA has a connected devices product. So this is the connected products list. And these are all the different things. So if you have some of these refrigerators, if you have this Kenmore refrigerator, you can actually get a utility signal to it. So, so uh, and some of the refrigerators um, can actually uh, defer the compressor to run, to not run during the high price time. So it's, it's remarkable. We don't have this in most homes yet, but these are the kinds of things that are coming. And uh, uh, your utility wants you to have these things. Go ahead. Right, so direct load control programs in the past, if you opt out, you might use, lose your incentive and they would give you so many opt outs per summer if it's done with prices, say, say it's uh, a critical peak price, um, then it's in your bill, and it, and it you know, it's, it's a, some of these programs are going to be opt-in, and some of them are, uh, have penalties, but some of them will be tariff-based. And if there's tariff-based, there's no baseline, and so they can, it's just part of your bill. 
that's actually the direction we think is, if we can align these with carbon prices, then by doing this, your carbon footprint's lower. And maybe these little turn on and not just turn off um, when you want them to. Uh, so uh, you guys all know these kinds of things, all this kind of smart technology. Uh, energy management's not the leading reason. Home security and cameras, uh, those are things people want. Uh, control of their lighting, control of their sprinklers. There's a lot of things like that coming into the home. And uh, this is my last slide. So the building, the building is now interacting with a lot of things around it. The building has health data and productivity and security. So we used to have just lighting and plug loads, but now we have EVs. In China, when you build a new office building, they add 15% to the KW for EV charging. So we're not doing that yet in our building codes. We're not saying, oh, you need to add more, to, because we want to charge the EVs during the day when you're at work, because that's the cleanest energy, is that middle of the day energy. So uh, Rich was talking a little about the microgrid here in Oakland, how to interact with the grid, or campuses. So campuses can actually um, do load, load interaction. A group of buildings, one building may be heating, and another building may cool. The Amazon headquarters in Seattle buys waste heat from the data center next door, and that's not an Amazon data center. They have a 20-year contract to buy waste heat from the data center. So we want to look at groups of buildings and how to make them more efficient, and then how we can aggregate and control buildings kind of as an integrated system. So this is uh, the kinds of things that are they're coming in, in and the, the technicians, none of this stuff will work, whether if you guys are, we need you to help uh, communicate to people that are getting trained in these technologies about this future and how these are good jobs, it's interesting jobs, and there's a lot of, I've been talking mostly about res here because the commercial is kind of complicated. You, you heard from Rich a little about the model predictive control, um, but the MPC in commercial, you're gonna see that before you do in homes. Um, because they're larger loads and we can afford those kind of controllers. So I'll, I'll stop there and answer questions. Go ahead. How dare you take away my microphone? Um, how many states are experiencing duck curves, right? And why not export over generation in the midday right, maybe to states that don't have as much right. renewable energy. Right. Uh, I don't know how many duck curves, certainly Hawaii, Vermont, um, California, D Rich, you know? Yes. 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 And Texas, too. Yeah. Right, and this problem is growing everywhere. So the so, but you're right. Actually, making the making the control boundaries larger so you can sell across the existing boundaries will help some. But this renewable integration problem is going to continue to get bigger everywhere. Any other questions? Well, but so so that's one of the biggest challenges is um, there are transmission constraints and there are local constraints. And we didn't talk a lot. Some of the duck curve is, is transmission constraint, that the, that the load and the supply aren't the, in the same area. So, so there's a lot of, you're going to see in general, the more you can do local, you know, it's sort of buy local, think local. It's true with energy, too. If you can generate local and use local, it's going to be more efficient. <clears throat> At the beginning, you said you, someone was going to talk about um, health implications of more and more EMF, RF, I mean, you go to the airport and you got 10 millimeter microwave oven that you're gonna walk through that I opt out every time. Um, and there's unexplained health crisis that we have throughout our society. Yeah. Um, we turn things down at night in my house, yeah. okay? Uh, to reduce, to have some time of the day yeah. when you're out of your shoes and actually grounded to the earth. Yeah. Um, has, has there been any, I know there's other countries that don't allow smart, smart meters, and we had ours removed. Yeah. Um, is there an unbiased study here on the health effects of, of maybe not your intense energy, but yeah. more and more low dosage, right. more and more exposure? Right. So, so I think your cell phone 
radio is more than your meter, right? So when you put that to your ear, that I've, I've read about policemen that have, I, you know, uh, Janie can comment if she wants, but in general, the smart meter EMF is extremely low. Certainly high, high, high power transmission lines, that's a little more something to be concerned about. Yeah, what, what, um, so I worked with someone who did the actual studies and went out and took measurements. Um, so there's much concern about electromagnetic fields, largely because you can't see them. And so what is, what's the effect? The, the work that I did indicated that you have to have very specific fields to get very specific biological effects. So that's one strike against the smart meter in that it's kind of a general, general field. Um, the other thing is what you mentioned earlier, is that is there tends to be pretty good shielding um, in the building. And the, the fields from the smart meter tend to be more projected outwards than coming inwards. And generally, they haven't done a whole lot of studies, but the studies they have found have found that there's other things that are more worthy of concern. Yeah, my question is, is kind of a follow-up to Larry's question, which is how do the, you know, the national grid, state grids, does each state operate independently and yeah. does PG&E operate independently of Southern California? Yeah. Gas and electric, yeah. how, you know, how does that exactly. work? So, so we, have, we have something called WEC, and that's the Western Area Coordinating Committee, is that... Western Electricity, Electricity yeah. So we have WEC, which is the north, the west, and then we have CAISO, and and CAISO is most of California, not all, all of California. That's the wholesale grid operator. That's the transmission system, and then we they have PG&E and Edison have the local systems and the distribution operators. They are in some cases maybe turning into something called DSOs, distribution system operators because we have more and more customers on CCAs, which are community choice aggregators. So we have a, and we have municipal utilities. We have a very complicated ecosystem in California, and it makes our, I call it policy spaghetti. You know, we have sort of all kinds of policies that are trying to do various things to get us cleaner and more cost effective. We have a storage agenda. We have a solar agenda. We have an efficiency agenda. We have demand response agenda. Um, and it's and they're not. It's very difficult to coordinate across this, but um, both s the three investor-owned utilities, San Diego Gas and Electric, SoCal Edison, and PG&E, um, all are regulated by the utility by the Utility Commission in, in San Francisco, <coughs> and they they are um, investor-owned means that they are for-profit institutions, but they're sort of monopolies. There is possibility that the state will take over PG&E because of the bankruptcy. Um, and uh, uh, there's something called locational marginal pricing. So we have we have uh, we have locational prices that are different that that depend that are that if you have a transmission we have a, a distribution system constrained area like imagine San Francisco's a peninsula, so you can only get power to it certain ways. And mm -hmm. when you have those peninsulas, the prices can be higher at certain times. Um, and so the grid is very, it, grid is not homogeneous. Uh, there's areas where we need to do more. And in Santa Barbara right now, where they're putting in a desal plant, they're trying to do as much demand response before they upgrade the distribution system. Because if they can do demand response on hot summer days, they don't have to, they can manage the load growth with um, customer, with behind the meter, what they call it non wires programs. So there's a lot of policy and technology around trying to use the electricity we have um, rather than building a bigger system all the time. And when you get to state to state? Well, each state, so, so again, PJM is the biggest wholesale market, and they're in many states. In fact, city of Chicago isn't even contiguous with the west of PJM territory. So some of these market operators operate. The ERCOT in Texas is completely separate from the rest of the country. It's not, you can't buy, the ERCOT's its own system. So we have a lot of different um, grids in the United States that actually are not, we don't have a national grid that's connected. So it, it, there's talk about it, but there's reasons why, and I'm not an expert on that. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.